Coming up next, we've got someone who cares a lot about making sure character representation is more inclusive in gaming, and that person is Michelle Ma. Michelle is a tech artist, and she currently is on the character team on Overwatch at Blizzard. She's also worked in the past at Disney, EA, Nickelodeon, and more. So, without further ado, let's show Michelle some hype in the chat and welcome her to the stage. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Ma and welcome to my talk, Inclusive Character Creator, an exploration of inclusive design for 3D character creators. So about me, I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm a character tech artist currently on the Overwatch team at Blizzard. This talk I'm presenting is my personal research that stemmed from my MFA thesis at the University of Southern California. So no, this does not belong to Blizzard. In the past, I've worked as an intern or associate at companies like Nickelodeon, Disney Research, Shell Games, and Electronic Arts. So here's a brief outline to start us off. I'll start with the introduction, describe some common issues in character creators, then go into the research and conceptualization of the project, and then go into the production process, and finally the conclusion. So on to the introduction. Why am I interested in character creators? The most important reason is it's my favorite and least favorite feature in games. I spend hours on it. I'm very much an augmentationist and I wanna see myself as a character, uh, myself or a character like me in the world. However, many times I feel discomfort with my physical identity as I explore the attributes available in modern character creators. So I wanted to challenge myself as a technical artist to dig into the production biases and limitations that go into character creators. More practically, there are many other reasons why this is an interesting topic. Character customization is becoming more prevalent in interactive media. It can help diversify the player character from RPGs like Monster Hunter World to social sims like Animal Crossing New Horizons, and it can increase player investment. Social platforms are converging with interactive media as well, and we are getting avatar makers from companies like Meta, Xbox, Snapchat, and more. Everyone wants a piece of that metaverse. And especially for free-to-play games, cosmetics and player customization are becoming a primary moneymaker. But the avatars we can create are often still limited, and that's what this research is about. Some of you may have seen the news earlier this summer about a diversity tool that came out from Activision Blizzard King that was controversial. Quick reminder that I'm not representing the views of Blizzard during this talk. This tool is used to visualize bias by measuring a character's representation against a norm, which is defined as a Western, white, neither young nor old, non-disabled, heterosexual, stereotypical body type man. And this uncomfortable representation of diversity permeates all of our society, from makeup standards to computer vision research to medical illustrations, and is very much how character creators are constructed, where all types of identities are pushed and pulled from a default body. It's such a normalized practice that now it seems too expensive or difficult to reimagine new methods. So for my research, I wanted to explore and reimagine new possibilities for character creators. The prototype showcases an inclusive design framework for game devs to construct their own character creators. With that, let's dive into some common representational issues. Here I'm showing you a brief industry snapshot of well-known games, old and new. There are a ton of different representational issues that we could get into, but my project focuses on four main ones. First is racial and ethnic representation, such as but not limited to poor inclusion and lighting of dark skinned characters or a lack of good hairstyles for curly, coily, and kiki hair types. For genderism and sexism, a lot of character creators tie binary gender selection to the initial body type and future game mechanics. So female characters also tend to get over-sexualized cosmetic options, and male characters often don't get as diverse a selection of cosmetic choices. Another is ableism. Some games do showcase prosthesis, much like an equipable accessory, but very few show other depictions of disability and other assistive tech. 
And of course, there's also lookism, sizeism, and the concept of appeal. Having a larger body size, having body hair, having a skin condition. There are lots of features society discriminates against because of harmful definitions of attractiveness and appeal that are carried into character creators. There are of course other issues like ageism, lack of representation of pregnancy, lack of cultural and religious representation, and more that I was not able to go into for this project, but maybe I can come back and address them in the future. So on to research and conceptualization methods. Uh, I want to highlight some of the positive related work I've seen, including AM Dark's open source Afro hair library, the facial diversity in metahumans, the work of pie crew artists like Citrus Lucy, options from Xbox avatars and Hero Forge, and the stylized rendering of Paralives. I'm also inspired by the inclusivity in some cartoons and universes where characters are designed shape first and identity first. Stylized character creators should aspire to achieve this sort of range. For my research, I relied heavily on the documentation of wonderfully diverse artists and developers that are working to change this field. There's a lot more documentation from 2D artists, which is part of the reason why I chose this stylized tune shaded approach. It was a great way to apply what I'm learning from all these amazing 2D guides. I also relied heavily on fashion and medical terminology. I'm surprised that games don't rely on fashion classifications more because the processes we used to pick foundation or pick clothes that match our body shape would be an amazingly informed and mindful experience when applied to a game environment. I learned a lot about myself and actually gained some more self-confidence going through these systems because even though the fashion industry has its toxic side, a lot of these classifications aren't meant to tell you that your body is bad. It's meant to uplift and inform your choices. The second and biggest part of my research process was talking to people and growing a diverse network that I can have really meaningful conversations with. So on the left here, you can see I tried quite a few methods of getting feedback, including interviews with seven participants, co-design co workshops with 16 participants, a milestone playtest with uh, 12 uh, survey feedback forms, and my ongoing Discord community. However, I really struggled with those methods um, because the general feedback was useful sometimes, um, but was also missing a lot of information. I attribute a lot of that to the fact that even though my community was pretty diverse, it really wasn't diverse in key areas. That's why in the later half of my project, I decided to focus my energy on talking to experts or people with lived experience rather than running more general feedback sessions, at least for this stage of production. And the process of getting consultation has been one of the more rewarding experiences for me, and it's a great motivation to know I will always have a lot to learn. Onto the production itself. So the first feature I tackled was the body models. This feature was special to me because I personally struggle with my body image every time I interact with a character creator. More than anything, I wanted to get this to a strong place. So I have three body sizes, small, medium, and large, and five body shapes, rectangle, oval, heart, hourglass, and pear. To start out, I randomize these features when you enter the game. I also have underwear options and a chest side slider on top of those. Next steps for this feature would be to add another larger body size based on the feedback I got, uh, show binders and surgical scars, as well as uh, include more parameterization to control limb sizes, height, and so on. I also want to revisit the terminology for body size because although small, medium, and large turned out to be the most acceptable classification I could come up with, I do think it needs revisiting. For skin tone, I relied, relied heavily on the Fenty makeup process of selecting a foundation, and I combined it with some ideas from 2D art tutorials. So you can see the 45 natural skin tones range from deep to medium to light, and then another ranges from cool to neutral to warm. I also show palm coloring because a lot of games that include darker skin tones fail to change the palm color. There's also an alternative skin palette just to show that fantasy skin tones don't have to be limited to pastels like many games do. It's important to include dark skin tones in fantasy palettes as well. 
The next, step, uh, the next steps for this feature would be to add skin textures for conditions like vitiligo, acne, freckles, and rosacea, and also to show body hair and markings. For disability representation, I focused on mobility aids such as prosthesis and wheelchairs. Currently, I have transhumeral and transfemoral amputations and prosthesis, as well as a wheelchair with a sitting pose that are compatible with all body types. It's actually really difficult to get accurate references of prosthesis without Casey Mitchell's help. So I'm really thankful I had her expertise in this process. And it's just another reminder of how Google can only get you so far. The next steps for this feature would be to show more mobility aids for poses uh, for walkers and crutches and to have more portrayals of physical disability. Also to show additional forms of everyday assistive tech like sensory aids and like wrist guards, things like that. And on to hair. This was my first time really modeling 3D hair. So I focused on figuring out the methodology and stylization. And yes, this is the only hairstyle currently available besides being bald. So I started with a hairstyle I knew I really haven't seen in games except for the In the Valley of the Gods dev blog. So I, I went for the mid-length loose curly coily hair. Um, most games either avoid this style or model the hair in a way that doesn't look breathable and soft. So I used the hair card and hair helmet technique outlined in there, that dev vlog I mentioned um, to achieve the style you see, which really didn't break the bank in terms of poly count. I think it was around 2K. The next steps are to add more hair options for each hair type and to have modular additions like edges, bangs, and updos, and to have a more intuitive hair coloring system. Right now, I rely on hair uh, classifications from colorists, and it sort of leaves out natural graying hair. For the user interface and experience, I wanted to be mindful of the user hierarchy. We read left to right, top to bottom, so I wanted to center black and brown identities when I made certain ordering choices. I also exposed the categorizations and descriptions I used for each feature through hover text to help educate the player and hold my own rationale accountable. It was also important to maintain discrete options for this prototype to properly test the combinations of features in a manageable and accessible way. The next steps for the UI would be to have menus that can actually handle the expanding content, as well as more intentful iconography, because a lot of this is placeholder. For my last production tidbit, I wanted to talk about rigging and shaders. I have a custom tune shader graph that gave me a little more control than the tune shader graphs I found on the asset store. I manually picked the light pairing colors for each skin tone because using a lighting formula would blow out some of the different color combinations. So I think I could reverse engineer a conditional lighting formula, formula in the future, but for now it's super manual. Um, the character was rigged in Maya using discrete meshes with a shared skeleton. There is only one blend shape so far for the chest size of each model, but that is the only blend shape. The next steps for tech art are to expand the system to include head shapes, clothes, facial features, and so on. And I'm sure as the scale of this grows, the management will be an interesting tech talk in itself. And with that, here is the current trailer. So this prototype is still in progress. I hope to add in a lot more features before I make it publicly available. The hope is that people will use this framework to design their own character creators rather than use it directly in their games because I imagine most developers have widely different contexts for their character creators. So in conclusion, why does this matter? An inclusive character creator is a better character creator. 
games are becoming more social and players are becoming more informed and more engaged. They want socially responsible games. Having mindful and inclusive values from the very beginning of your project will protect your production from harmful shortcuts or having to add inclusivity too late, and it'll help create a more sustainable production. And even if your team is not as diverse as you would like, there are many alternatives to inviting diverse perspectives into your process. And having that diversity of thought will empower your game with a more creative process. We have the talent and the resources to design more inclusive games. However, time and time again, we see those capabilities spent on an old framework. I can't wait until more resources are spent on reimagining our ways of tackling these production problems. And so here's some key takeaways. Building character creators off of a default body that relies on medium norms is a way of perpetuating social harm. It is important to center marginalized and underrepresented identities in the design process and to receive proper consultation from those whose identities we try to present. I learned a lot about urgency in the past few years while attending school and working part time and discussions about burnout or questions about why diversity and inclusion are never really the priority always come up. Urgency should be a tool to compel developers to innovate and make beautiful games and experiences. It should not be a reason to output outdated work that replicates the issues of its predecessors. And of course, these takeaways do not apply to just character creators. They're extremely relevant as pillars I use in my professional life to unlearn white supremacy and patriarchy when it comes to representation and production. And I'm not gonna read this slide, but I did generate a summative checklist for my current findings for game developers to read. The entire paper and checklist is available on ProQuest for free. So I'd like to give a special thanks to my thesis committee, the faculty, the advisors and consultants that, and of course my cohort that helped me with my thesis throughout school. And I'd also like to thank my current very supportive tech art team at Blizzard. <laughs> So thank you, that's all I have. You can contact me through email or go to my site at michelledoeswhat.com. And that's it. Thank you, Michelle, for that super insightful talk. Did y'all find any quotes from Michelle inspiring, useful, brilliant? Please tweet them, post them on the social medias with our hashtag GDOC Expo.